let me um, ask uh, our co-trustee and founder, Dominic Ligot, to join me first in this uh, quick chit-chat before we ask our panelists to join us. Right. Uh, morning, okay Michelle. Lang din na- morning. Hindi na kailangan ng marker for doc. Nakita, kilala na natin yan. <laughs> Uh, ating usapan yesterday. <laughs> no, so just um, before we begin, the, the panel is on ethical considerations in analytics and AI, right? And it's I'm already prepping everyone. No, this is with the panelists, with the profile of the the people that we have in the panel, right? Um, let's start first with yesterday, because ang dami, no, um, yun yung maganda sa face to face, eh. Uh, after your talk, there were some questions, but when you went down the stage, ang daming lumapet, no? daming nagtatanong, and then uh, really you know, asking for guidance. So how, how, what do I need to really do to protect um, my sector or my company or my, my uh, students and, and all that? So what is, what is the general sentiment that you got from, from the uh, audience yesterday or maybe even through social media that you received? Yeah, one one thing that I found, uh, I think I shared this yesterday, is that there's there seems to be a very big negative sentiment about AI the moment uh, ChatGPT came out, uh, which I found was an interesting uh, break in pattern. Whenever a new technology becomes famous, uh, I'm sure we're familiar with the concept of the hype cycle, right? uh, And normally the pattern is everyone gets so excited about it. And then there's this uh, trough of disillusionment, as uh, Gartner would coin it, before people become, uh, I would say, adept and mature at implementing the technology. But it seems for AI, we we skipped that that uptrend, and then we went directly to the trough. And I'm I was thinking about that. I think it's one reason is probably because AI has been around for a while. Uh, long before chat GPT, but we've always treated it as kind of that uh, promising but yet to deliver kind of technology. But by now, uh, even without large language models, many industries, many companies have already been implementing some form of AI. In fact, we learned that in yesterday's panel. So we seem to have skipped into doom and gloom land almost immediately. But then... uh, you know, I, f- I find that the regulatory questions are uh, suddenly thrust in front of everyone, uh, which makes our panel today very important because uh, I don't know if it's just me. I think generally talking about ethics, talking about the law, I'm, an, I'm not saying people don't care about ethics, but it, I find that it's not second nature uh, to the people doing their day-to-day lives. There's also a big... I would say conflation between being ethical and being legal. You know, uh, you know, in, in so many words, sometimes even if you're compliant with the law, you're not actually yeah. doing ethical work. You know what I mean? So, so thinking of ethics is is really something new. I would say for most people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and it's good that we started early, no? I mean, also because you're part of the the board of trustees of the AEP from the beginning. Um, it was um not an afterthought, right? Uh, we were already uh exploring the possibilities, not possibilities. That's part of the part of the frameworks that we really have started to plan in the early days was an ethical framework for implementing analytics back then, right? And data science. So um, what, is, what is going to be, if you can share, no? what, what's, uh, how is that plan going to uh, evolve now that it is on AI, if at all? Yeah, I think one, one we, we plan to talk about this uh, in the panel. One thing that probably people haven't really been focusing on is the, the issue of AI safety. Like uh, before ChatGPT, most discussions around ethics were really more about data handling, like uh, how good is mm-hmm. your data set? Uh, how are you managing, you know, things like model drift, you know, and certainly those things are still uh, valid uh, and hopefully we get to, to tackle them later. 
But the issue of AI safety has to do as well, and uh, one of our panelists uh, will probably discuss this better than me. How do you manage uh, autonomous agents? Because that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, analytics mm -hmm. has always been driven by humans. I mean, we're the ones that that prompt, uh, you know, uh, data visualization. We're the ones that gather the data. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in the in the in the current paradigm, AI uh, algorithms can act on their own. And they are also mm -hmm. subject to the usual challenges that analytics has. If the data was wrong or they weren't trained properly, uh, then uh, they can malfunction. But there's an added risk. That risk is how do you specify a goal for the AI? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that, that's that's a, that's a, actually that's a classical problem in in right. AI uh, research. But there's in a way there's two problems to it. Usually, we're not able to articulate a goal in, in ways that an algorithm can interpret. And the way the algorithm might interpret it after that uh, can be totally uh, you know, uh, misaligned. You know, that's the term, mm -hmm. aligned, uh, unaligned with what we want. So that's a new thing, I think, for the mainstream. People mm -hmm. need to come to grips with that so that uh, we can plot a good course moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this panel will also give us some more inputs, right? Um, and uh, what we what we also want to um, in this, I, I have a question already here in the board, but just to uh, check that off because I expect that the, the Q and A board is going to be full later on. No, um, with a, with the rapid growth in uh, innovations involving AI, ethical regulatory policies being created in the Philippines, and and so on. That's the panel for. You know that uh, that's going to come up in in a few minutes, no? So I'm just gonna uh, check that off. But uh, since and that's the point, um, the reason why uh, we need to discuss this, uh, we did discuss ethical implications of analytics and data science last year. Yeah, and even before that, I think we we've had uh, side discussions as well with with uh, with uh, some practitioners, right? But um, when we talk about informing um regulations now which was uh we, we still are focused on innovation but now informing regulations um i am a student and uh, i want to get into it is that something that i need to be aware of right now because regulations when we talk about policies and laws especially coming from the government that may take some time right but i want to learn it now so it, it, how is, is that like preventing people to to learn it right now with the tools already you know easily accessible i think in the um what we are seeing lang is uh in terms of creating enterprise applications um that there should be a part of it should be um you know there ano ba? safeguarded yeah safeguarded um but for Consumers, do you think that can really be there can really be a regulation around use of AI when it's out there in the wild? Uh, yeah, I think that's also another break in pattern compared to where we were a year ago. Uh, the fact that the access to these tools has is, has become pretty much universal. This is the point mm -hmm. I was also making yesterday about the roles uh, around AI are expected to change because before uh, you needed special tools, you needed special training. Uh, that's not to say you don't need training today, but there was a lot of gatekeeping. I mean, literally, like if you didn't know how to write code, if you you know were not familiar with data science, then the likelihood that you would encounter uh, and be able to manage models is relatively low. And mm -hmm. as of November 2022, that changed dramatically. Now everyone can just log on to any chatbot and produce a conversation. Anyone can log on to any image generator and produce images. And I remember it was also Colin who mentioned yesterday mm. that the application space is exploding uh, like, you know, like wildfire. New apps are being created. And I think that brings it brings it back to the question of the idea of regulation is also to curtail abuse. How do we manage this growth and how do we inform people about which tools are safe, which tools are, uh, you know, uh, are 
are helpful. We don't have any governance around that. Right. For all you know, mm -hmm. half of the tools out there have embedded malware. We don't know. I mean, these are things yeah. that we need to mm -hmm. make people aware of so that we can, you know, we can manage the, the, the growth properly. And it makes, may, may we've share. always said, uh, yeah. Go sorry, ahead. sorry, this is not yet the panel, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But, but you raise an important question and it always arises in our conversations about since it's in the wild, is there a regulatory approach? Well, you know, you can get guns in the wild now. Uh, there are so many loose firearms in this country, but it doesn't change the fact that the regulations are in place. And if you're caught with a gun that is not authorized, there are sanctions for it because there are well-known dangers to having a gun. So in the same way, of course, if you have a loose firearm at your house and you never actually put a bullet in it, you just keep cleaning it and admire it for, it, for its engineering, then the danger is curtailed, right? In the same way, if you have an LLM in your parang sandbox at home and you keep believing what it says, so it's deluding you in ways that you don't even know, and then you spout it to other people, and not attributing it to an LLM, then the danger could just be you and impacting the people whom you are misleading because you are misinformed, right? But if you're not, if you're now using that in a professional capacity, there's a real danger. So if you use it to prepare a report, for example, in your job, or if you use it to submit a paper for a class. And so these are the known dangers. That's why in the EU AI Act, certain high-risk uses of LLMs are proposed to be regulated, not really banned outright, but regulated in the sense that you have to declare that you're using it or you have to uh, attribute the source of where you got it, things like this. So it's not completely okay. unregulated. Correct. Uh, Professor Ben, um, mm -hmm. let us officially start the panel. So if I may, uh, I will turn it over to, to Doc to first introduce our panelists. Um, and uh, that you have an hour to do that. So I hope uh, that should be enough. And then we'll take in questions uh, for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Sige, magandang patikim yun, no? um, okay, Before I jump to introductions, uh, this is going to be the panel on ethics and regulation. I wanted to briefly share one slide from yesterday's uh, keynote. Uh, if you remember, this is the chart where uh, people from Stanford Research and the, hu the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute did a checklist. Uh, now that the, the EU AI Act is out, do how 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 well do the existing major developers of AI models fare against that? And the grand conclusion is none of them would pass. At best, you have someone. I think it's hugging face here in the middle that uh, complies with at least 36 out of the 48 clauses. But most of them, like you have uh, Anthropic, they only comply with seven. Yeah. AI21 complies only with eight, uh, and then so on and so forth. The most popular one, chat GPT, about 25. So I mean, the, the question that faces pretty much any government is the prospect of how do you manage innovation while keeping uh, keeping it safe. And I think that's a good way to, in a way, open our, our panel today. So, okay, without further ado, I, I'll just run through who our panelists will be today. So we're joined by five uh, experts in this emerging field. I, I still say it's emerging because although studies of ethics and safety have been around for a while, I think this is also the first time uh, these terms are being introduced in kind of the mainstream. Uh, our first pan, uh, our first panelist later will be Ms. Leantonia Chua, who is a teaching fellow at the Center for AI and Digital Policy in Washington. Uh, she's an associate editor of the 2022 edition of the Center's annual report, the AI and Democratic Values Index, and a designated coordinator for Asia. Recently, Lian founded the AMBIT, a civic society coalition converging majority world nations, basically the global south, as it's referred to at the Center of Ethical AI, and, re and she represents as its global convener. And uh, the Ambit Philippines is its founding chapter. She co-chairs its national council and recently launched a public call for ethics, safety, and governance of AI in the Philippines. So later we'll share, uh, we'll have the opportunity to share the link to that petition uh, for people to sign up if, uh, uh, if, they, if they wish. 
I also want to mention that Leanne was also a collaborator of mine at Data Ethics PH during the pandemic. Our next panelist will be Professor Benito Bentihanki, who is the Jose E. Quisha Professor of Business Ethics at the Department of Management and Organization of the Ramon V. Del Rosario College of Business at the De La Salle University. He has taught the following courses at some point in his nearly 40 years of teaching, sociology, statistics, research methods, quality management, business ethics, organizational behavior, change management, strategic management, corporate governance, management theory, uh, of course, business intelligence and analytics, and humanistic management, service management, and uh, action research and faith-based management. Uh, Professor Ben conducts executive development seminars on humanistic management under the University School of Lifelong Learning, and he has also served as a speaker or consultant to various private government and educational organizations. Uh, we talked about the story of Professor Ben's CV yesterday, and I, I'm sure he'll be able to share more details on that anecdote later when we talk about AI safety. Our next panelist will be Professor Peter C. Uh, who has decades of experience in profes uh, professorial education, pursuing diverse interests. He's the UP director of MicroCasa, uh, micro-credentials for lifelong learning and employability, building capacities for developing agile educational interventions in Southeast Asian universities, which is an EU-funded project. He's the chairman uh, of the Privacy Experts Group, eHealth of the Department of Health and the Department of Science and Technology, uh, consultant of the development of the National AI Governance Framework, where AAP was a participant, an independent consultant of the National Ethics Committee, project leader of the development of a data privacy toolkit for research involving human participants in the Philippines, uh, which is a DOSTP CHRD funded initiative, and co-founder of Mood Learning, an e-learning and technology startup at the University of the Philippines Enterprise Center for Technopreneurship. Uh, our next panelist will be Mr. Jelaine Manrique, who is an advisory partner and head of technology consulting in KPMG in the Philippines. He has more than 16 years of extensive profes uh, professional experience, experience in the fields of IT, audit, SOC, uh, SOC or attestation, cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, ERP implementations, robotic process automation, data analytics, and IT project management. And finally, uh, Last but not the least, we will have attorney Senando Angelo Santiago, who is an intellectual property lawyer with a particular interest in the merger of ethical artificial intelligence and data science in law. At present, he is a lawyer researcher at the University of the Philippines Law Center, and part of his work involves advocating data literacy among those involved in law and governance and pushing the boundaries of law, IP, and AI. As a data scientist, he has spearheaded AI research projects at the UP Law, which includes predicting topics and review materials in reviewing for the bar examination. He's also the go-to resource person at the UP Law Center whenever AI is involved, especially in policy. In the private sector, he provides consulting services to startups and clients in the fields of data science, AI, and also intellectual property. And he has, uh, I think, an emerging combination of expertise having a master's degree in data science from AIM and a Juris Doctor in, and materials engineering degrees, both from the UP Diliman. Okay, so let's kick off this panel. I want to first turn it over to, to Leanne. Um, Leanne, can you briefly at least talk about what is, I mean, defining for everyone, what, what are the topics involved whenever we talk about AI safety and AI ethics and AI regulation, at least from your uh you know, from your background working with the Center of AI and Digital Policy? Sure. Um, if you may, um, may I present, uh, can I screen share? Yeah, go ahead, you can share a slide. Sure. Awesome. Okay, um, kindly let me know if um, it's uh, on and invisible for, for the public right now. Yeah, we can see it. Awesome, so to the question, we never run out of anything and everything about AI recently in the mainstream news cycle, right? So what is really it's all about and how do we end up as to how it is now? So let's go first 
to um, the subcultures that's happening right in the capital of AI, at least one capital of AI, Silicon Valley. And it's very important that we talk in context. And um, this uh, diagram that I'm showing now is the um, AI rival factions. So um, there's this um, dangerous um, divide happening right now in the discussion of AI and AI ethics and the AI governance at large. So this is um, from the Washington Post. It is a quick quiet guide to decoding Silicon Valley's strange but powerful AI subcultures. So you see there's the um, horizon on dystopic sentiments and then utopic sentiments. And then there's this um, vertical on people who want AI development to slow down and just cannot stop. Now, uh, we are seeing from left to right, uh, uh, Elias Yuvkovsky, Tristan Harris, Elon Musk. And then in the slow down side, you have Timnit Jibru. And then on the utopic, and then the cannot stop is uh, Sundar Pichai and um, uh, some Atman among others. So how did we end up here, right? Just, just to see the picture. Uh, as of uh, 2020, so it all started actually, at least in the mainstream media, at this, uh, in December 2020, uh, with Timnit Jebru's controversial termination from the AI ethics team of Google. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's uh, a significant mark right there. Now, she is one of the authors in the research on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Now, the um, audience for this summit can look what stochastic parrots is, but basically it's um, talking about garbage in and garbage out in the context of large language models. And then in November 2021, so we jump for a year, um, UNESCO's first ever global standard on AI ethics, the recommendation on the ethics of AI was adopted by all 193 member states. So in the perspective of the Center for AI and Digital Policy, we see this as um, a significant uh, landmark uh, a landmark um, regulatory or soft law achievement in the realm of um, AI ethics at the global level. And uh, then in Leanne, just to interrupt briefly. Yeah. All right, I'm just checking if you're showing the right slide as we're seeing just uh, a picture of, ano ba to? looks like a soda. Oh, no, it looks like a, uh, the emergency light. That's all we're seeing. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. Uh, let me check on that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing the timeline now. Ah, okay. So there's okay. there's a delay, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. And then, um, so 2022, uh, China's Cyberspace Administration advanced regulation for data protection, algorithmic management, and measures for deep fakes every year from draft, open comment to... Um, uh, passing of the legislation. And then, and it's still going on right now, 2023. Now, fast forward on March 2022, 2023 is, um, the, is when the open letter calling labs for at least six month pause on giant AI experiments was released. And um, it is the, the argument was. Um, due to the potentially catastrophic effects of um, AI cap capabilities in the society, which was um, um, launched by the Future of Life Institute, a group in UK. Now, in March 30, 2023, uh, we at the Center for AI and Digital Policy filed a Federal Trade Commission complaint against OpenAI to uh, open an investigation and suspend the further sale of large language model products such as GPT-4 um, based on consumer rights. And then na, uh, for last month, so May 1, 2023, Geoffrey Hinton quit Google, May 4, 
the White House announced new actions to promote responsible EI innovation and um, asked the major um, AI key play the AI key players invited them in the White House. Actually, yesterday was the Biden roundtable on AI. And, uh, and then May 12, so the AMBIT um, launched a public call on ethics, safety, and governance of AI in the Philippines. And then May 30, 2023, so end of the last month, a statement on mitigating the risk of extinction from AI uh, as a global priority alongside other societal risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war, was released by the Center for AI Safety. And then this month, the European, the European Parliament has adopted the EU AI Act with an overwhelming majority vote. So, AI, what exactly are the dangers? Identifying the problem, the first step in the scientific process, the core in entrepreneurship, and the heart of philosophy, asking the right questions. No doubt there is a growing concern. It is a mix of legitimate and unnecessary worry, at least in my perspective, both adding load to the dangers of uh, AI. So first, let us look at the legitimate and foreseeable risks. So at, in my perspective, I see AI dangers as a horizon of risks across intelligent systems. So you have local and imminent risks, you have short to long-term risks, you have existential risks. And then the intelligent systems that are involved are from human intelligence systems to AI. Now, there are other systems that is in between um, human and AI. Uh, that is also of concern as for the moment. Now, AI is a lot of work. And as we can see here, so with the selected highlights that I featured a while ago, I plot it where are the actors and the concerns are in this graph uh, I, Leanne, from my perspective. We're, we're still just seeing the highlight timeline, uh, just, just to let you know. Okay. I think there's really a, quite a delay with... Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe give me a heads up when it's already on. I think we're still plotted. stuck at, yeah, it's still stuck at highlights timeline. Are you able to move it forward? Are we good? Because in my screen, in Zoom as well, it's already, it has already moved forward. So give me a go if it's already there. I'm still seeing the highlights timeline, 2020s slide. Okay, uh, hold on. Let, let's settle that. Yeah, maybe um, if we can come back to you in a moment, uh, Leanne, uh, just yeah. so we can hear from everyone else. Um, I'd like to pass the, uh, the ball to uh, Dr. Ben. You already started the ball rolling earlier. Uh, would you like to open up with some discussion on some of the dangers that, of LLMs that you have personally seen and some ideas on these? Yeah, okay. My, my pleasure, Doc. Uh, so the dangers of LLMs, I think Lian touched on a lot of the core points, but I'm always coming from an educational uh, point of view. And the goal really of education is uh, to develop an informed, engaged and productive citizenry in a functioning democracy. So this is the big project that we have. We're trying to develop our people, right? And of course, we are interested in any tool that can help us in achieving this grand goal of uh, engaged, informed, and productive citizens. Now, the dangers with LLMs, I can highlight just four. That's always top of mind when we speak of ethics. The first is it tends to perpetuate biases in information. How does it do this? Uh, I always cite my case. Uh, every time I, I'm invited in conferences, the, the host has a choice. They can either get my bio from me personally or get it from my internet uh, website, or 
the new option, ask ChatGPT to prepare an introduction. Now, in, in a number of cases, I have been introduced as having gotten my doctorate from Cambridge, from Oxford, from UCLA, from the University of St. Gallen, from the University of Pittsburgh. And I keep waiting for me to be introduced as having gotten my PhD from the La Salle University. Now, why is the LLM claiming that I graduated from all of these universities? Well, mainly because it's a very lossy approach to knowledge, right? It's like a huge JPEG of the internet. It approximates, averages everything that it has digested. And in that averaging, my De La Salle University kind of gets lost. And as we know, averaging is prone to biases, extreme values, etc. So it kind of loses the detail that is so important when you're dealing with ground truth, you know, with facts. And therefore, the bias for international universities are in the data. It's embedded in it, and the LLM will keep spouting it. Now, in recent versions, when you ask ChatGPT, now I'm a film director, an, an artist, and so on. So they have cleaned up some of the false claims about universities. And this is, of course, through human intervention, as we know. And because I have given feedback to Microsoft on this issue. So the bias translates to misinformation. So there are now hundreds of people walking around uh, the country thinking that I'm a fellow alum of uh, the sitting president you know, who also went to Oxford. But this is not true. And I can expect uh, an email anytime soon from the Oxford Alumni Association of the Philippines telling me that I should not be claiming this. But I never claimed it. Those who got the information from GPT claims it. So even our students now are submitting papers that are wholly produced by LLMs. And they're very confident that this is actually factual. So this is the third danger other than uh, perpetuating, perpetuating biases and spreading misinformation. The third danger is it makes people dependent, dependent on spouted, unvetted information. So if I go back to the first goal of our project, which is to develop productive, engaged uh, citizens, such citizens, you'd be critical thinkers because, of course, they will vote. They will vote on a policy. Uh, they will give opinions on public issues. Uh, like whether, you know, uh, F-22 fighter jets should be parked on our bases right now because of the tension between U.S. and China. These are basic issues, and citizens have to have in, uh, opinions on these things. But if they get information from unvetted sources, which they cannot verify sources of, then we really have a basic problem. The fourth, which is probably the umbrella problem, is the loss of critical thinking. So we will now have the tendency, unless it's a check, of course, of people just floating around thinking they know things when actually they are being misled or lulled into this state of complacent, uninformed uh, ignorance, actually, essentially. So these are the four major dangers, but I think they're not unsolvable. If we, we, if we take them uh, to heart that they're the limitations of LLMs and, you know, I have a very aggressive education campaign and teach all of our people to understand what's really going on under the hood, and, you know, uh, in time, uh, regulations will kick in, but not soon enough, as we know, no? because even the EU Act will take at least 18 months to fully kick in, and that's just the European situation. In the Philippines, it might take longer than that. So the goal is really to educate people about these four dangers, biases, misinformation, uh, and this, and, and this uh, dependence that it creates, and finally, the loss of critical thinking. Back to you, Doc. Thanks, uh, Professor Ben. Actually, one of the, the issues you mentioned is misinformation or disinformation. I can't see an alternative at the moment. Uh, maybe a better model can detect it. I find that kind of an open-ended problem among many. You know? uh, yeah. Well, we can come back to that later you know, after we hear yes, from the rest. Yes, I have some opinions on that. All right. OK, um, uh, over to Professor Peter. Uh, I, re I remember we were working together on the, the governance framework initiative that you were leading, but that was obviously before ChatGPT. So maybe you can uh, give a little bit of discussion on that. And uh, maybe, I don't know if some of your views have changed since that time. Are, are my slides showing? I can see AI governance challenges. Oh, this is going to be very quick. Uh, there's a 
uh, a bunch of uh, principles, so called. Uh, they they uh, uh, people feel they they need to uh, drive governance uh, on on principles, and I will just pick uh, a, a few. Uh, and here uh, would be about transparency and explainability, and uh, try to show the inherent tension between trying to to govern. Uh, AI and uh, the needs and uh, AI fulfilling uh, the expected needs of, of our people. So uh, AI has to be understandable and explainable even, even to uh, non-technical people. However, if you look at uh, the recent developments uh, of uh, ChatGPT and large language models, you're talking about trillions of parameters. So uh, the, the black box effect is really, uh, at this point anyway, uh, is inescapable. Uh, there are also nonlinear models uh, making uh, extremely challenging the mapping of relationships between input features and output uh, predictions. So for our local uh, developers, uh, please consider uh, the following uh, uh, tentative solutions or these initial uh, takes on, on this problem of explainability and transparency. Uh, and I, I discussed somewhere that uh, these are not sufficient, no, but necessary. Uh, principles. No? In any case, you could be looking at uh, more interpretable models, uh, decision trees, uh, rule-based, uh, human, human uh, extraction of human uh, readable rules, uh, sensitivity analysis, you know, uh, changing the features and see how it affects the uh, output predictions, uh, localized explanations. And uh, I think this is one area where we have to double down because I'm kind of worried that uh, uh, many of our uh, colleagues or some of our colleagues are too enthusiastic to regulate the industry. No? Uh, we could also be looking at uh, documentation, uh, looking at uh, the kind of, uh, of architectures, model architectures we have, training data. I see that uh, it's a it's a, a good news that uh, you know via the uh, uh, DTI will be using government data for sandbox uh, development purposes. We should also be looking at uh, uh, evaluation. In other words, we have a serious challenge here that is, I think, underestimated at this point. Now, we can also be uh, looking at the very attempts at regulations, and I think I, I played the uh, Hungarian roles uh, in, in, in some discussions. And uh, the idea really of a top down, uh, global, generalized uh, kind of regulation. Uh, might have some some serious challenges and if not altogether uh, uh, futile. Uh, you see, in on the one hand, uh, AA systems becoming increasingly complex, difficult to understand. There's also the potential backfiring uh, of, uh, of regulatory moves we have to make, uh, creating development of more powerful and possibly more dangerous AA systems. As uh, someone uh, immersed in uh, social science literature, I'm always concerned about unintended, unanticipated consequences. And I, in my milieu, uh, I, I, I feel very strongly about uh, laws that turned out to be counterproductive. Now, I'm talking about uh, laws that affect research. And uh, we have a separate session for that where uh, there is supposedly uh, governmental mental wisdom on regulating certain activities that turned out, and then they turned at such regulations uh, have been, uh, or I mean, came out really counterproductive. No? So um, I'm not, of course, saying that regulation is a no-go zone for us. Uh, there is a potential uh, best practice uh, in the way um, at least uh, Americans would uh, be uh, regulating the high-frequency trading and algorithmic trading. There's a process for that, looking at uh, designs of algorithm, testing, real-time monitoring. There's a kill function, kill switch function. Uh, there's post-trade controls and monitoring. This is a very narrow application of AI, and I cannot exaggerate the importance of this, but I say that there is promise somewhere. We just have to be very methodical, very targeted in the way we hope to regulate uh, AI, because otherwise, uh, if I'm uh, hearing the sentiments uh, of, of some of people, the people correctly, they're trying to regulate uh, uh, um, the weather uh, with respect to uh, to AI uh, research and, and development. So uh, I think this is a good start. I, I've looked at this uh, and, and look for um, ways we can approach this via law, but uh, it's a lot of homework for us to uh, to do. So again, uh, we, we have to look at governance in a broad framework rather than simply, uh, you know, agit pro uh, regulation. Uh, you can look at... Uh, um, contestation areas in, in governance, corporate boardrooms, 
uh, in in I mean in the places where I have influence, I, it is my requirement to uh, be incorporating more consciously, deliberately AI tools into the workflow. It's not an option. Um, for education, there has to be a, a process of, of deliberation, a reflection on the use of these AI tools and uh, uh, um, abundant uh, dose of, of, uh, of, uh, of warnings. And of course, uh, stakeholding is, is an important consideration, uh, especially if it's going to be productive. So just to highlight the, the belabor, the obvious that governance is not equal regulation. Regulation is not equal legislation. One of my favorite peeve is that our privacy laws are relatively un, uh, outdated. We need to update that. We need to get together the, the government agencies and just start thinking about updating the IIRs, you know, the... Uh, the, the the laws and they have to advocate for for uh, possible revisions in in light of the uh, emergence of of AI of diverse AI practices in the country as opposed to uh, starting from scratch. No, so um, I'm familiar with the data privacy law. It is uh, based on some old uh, uh, some old set of laws, European laws, and there are probably uh, inspirations from other places. But I would say that it needs serious updating. Um, so um, one, one possible illustration of this is in the area of discrimination and bias. Uh, you can ask our, we can ask ourselves the question whether discrimination and bias is inescapable. There are certainly biases there that are uh, obvious that we should be uh, going against. Uh, and that kind of bias, for instance, would be bias against women and LGBTQIA. Uh, social credit scoring uh, that violates human rights. So if your uh, credit scoring would... would uh, Praise Xi Jinping and uh, hate uh, Winnie the Pooh. That's probably a bad kind of social credit system uh, that violates uh, human rights uh, of people to travel, to have uh, loans, and so on. So there are sources of bias, as uh, Ben pointed out, uh, training data, the algorithms. But we should be worry more, worry more incipient kind of bias against AI illiteracy. Uh, I think it's a disservice to our people if we don't warn them that in many places now, screening of, for instance, Corel uh, uh, is primarily done by the machine. Before it gets in contact with actual human being, machines will do the initial vetting. And if you write your CV not thinking about this, uh, not, not mindful of this kind of process, I think uh, you are uh, at the receiving end. <laughs> of bias against AI illiteracy. There's, there's uh, targeted news also. Uh, this is an open problem. But uh, the solution to, to, to challenges in AI would be more responsible AI, but uh, something that we have to, uh, to be really uh, cautious in terms of uh, regulation. So uh, the next question has to do with the kind of digital order we have to envision as a society. There's this reality that uh, we are not really big players out there. Let's face it, we are not an AI powerhouse. Uh, and we are, besides being organ donors, we are also donors of, uh, of data uh, and uh, consumers of, of AI products. So uh, where is the, um, the resistance, so to speak? So um, I, I see that, for instance, uh, Union Bank bought... Uh, uh, um, the, the local business in a way of Citibank, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but if you're looking at applications of uh, LLMs, uh, just note, for the uh, note the fact that uh, there are alternatives out there and um, these alternatives might be a good starting point for our uh, AI developers. Just note, however, that um, large language models, uh, even if they, uh, they have alternatives and powerful ones and they can be de developed cheaply, also know that large language models, uh, being able to train the, the, the alternatives, also know that large language models can also learn from the, the llamas of the world. So if you're looking at uh, what is an old data, uh, how quickly uh, uh, open source people, so you don't have a cluster of GPUs, certainly, uh, unless you have your Microsoft uh, able to uh, devote billions of dollars to develop that uh, GPU farm. Uh, you will have to be looking at uh, um, you know, models that would be useful with just, say, less than 2 billion uh, parameters. And you're looking at uh, Llama, Alpaca, Vicuña, and that these are 
the places where we probably can can start uh, developing our own uh, as uh, as a, as a country. But uh, as I said, the the looming large in this kind of uh, of context is really the the global players of of uh, of AI. So thank you very much. And this is just a slide that says uh, it's cheaper now to uh, to do more AI. So uh, just probably reiterate the point that the solutions to AI problems would would need to be more. Uh, more AI, more um, conscious, deliberate, uh, responsible effort to to develop AI. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Peter. Actually, one thing that rang in my head, especially when you mentioned high frequency trading, is many of these rules and regulations. Uh, for example, in banking, we have the Basel Accord, were usually in reaction to some disaster or crisis and. That's kind of the question. Do we want to wait for a disaster before we regulate? But then on the other hand, we seem to be anticipating many disasters. So maybe if we have another chance to come back to you, you can give an opinion on this. But since you mentioned uh, regulation, I'd like to give it to attorney uh, Angelo, uh, who's uh, in the law profession. So uh, Angelo, would you like to talk about kind of your thoughts on AI regulation and how, how would you think about it? Hi. Um, I, I, am I audible now? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. But your slides right. have not appeared. Okay. Let me share my screen again. Yeah, okay. Right. okay. Yeah. yeah, we can So, see. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity, um, Doc, you know, and AAP for, for bringing me here now for a legal perspective on AI. Um, as you mentioned, I'm teaching in UP Law. So this is part of my lectures. I'm still teaching lawyers in addition to students. So um, we're talking about regulation, but let me take you on a little bit of a journey on how we view technology. You know? So first and foremost, we have the fundamental law of the land, the Constitution. And the Constitution says that the state shall give priority to science, technology, among others, to foster patriotism, etc. So... With this, no, there is already that um that mandate to the state, the people telling the state, okay, give priority to science and technology, and um and kasunod no, no would be also another mandate to people to the state to give priority to R and D invention and innovation, and so akibat non, since AI is part of this innovation invention R and D, of course there is that um that intellectual property law, no, uh, so to speak. Kanina, you showed the slide on, on um, that was shown yesterday. Tapos, halos walang compliance on copyright laws to, no? You, th there's that one slide you showed. So, um, the intellectual property system is here, no, to supposedly encourage innovation, while at the same time, no, on this other side of the coin, to encourage um, creation for the benefit of the people. Kaya the state wants to promote innovation and invention because people will ultimately benefit from it. So, um, how do we look at technology now? No, so we have that constitutional mandate. Um, I categorize it into a few. No, so we first look as intel at technology as property, and we have laws on that. We have the civil code. Um, you could own property. You could also own technologies. No, you could own equipment, for example labor code, um, the intellectual property code, and even the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. The Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act acknowledges um, yung mga indigenous knowledge systems and practices of indigenous peoples as technology that they own. Okay. But in addition to property, um, technology is also viewed by the law as a means to facilitate good. Right? So that's why we have the E-Commerce Act. The E-Commerce Act um, basically legitimizes online transactions. No? That's where our Shopee, Lazada are based on because this one um, allows no, for um, digital transactions to take place. And then in the law, so during the pandemic, uh, well, prior to that, we have um, we, in, in courts, no, you could show now electronic evidence. Um, there's also during the pandemic, di ba, hindi tayo pwede makapag-meeting, di ba? So, 
the the court now allowed and even the SEC allowed teleconferencing um the conduct of meetings through teleconferencing and that's acknowledged by by the law to be um acceptable no and then also technology is a means to do harm so we have the anti photo and video voyeurism act which was actually repealed no um but for a long time it's been there the cybercrime prevention act the safe spaces act you know where you could do harassment online sexual harassment online and then the anti online sexual abuse and exploitation of children so bringing them all together and um putting the laws in the context of a timeline um let me show you this diagram <clears throat> so the four industrial revolutions we are in the fourth industrial revolutions and let me plug in the key laws that um that i showed earlier you know with respect to the philippines so we are already in the fourth no artificial intelligence etc so yan makita niyo no yung civil code you know when you uh, owning property was in the 1950s pero yung konsepto ng ai yung konsepto ng computers lumabas pa much much later okay so in fact <clears throat> the first landmark legislation um as i mentioned no in, in relation to digit the digital sphere would be e-commerce act so dun pa lang 2000 pero padulo na siya ng third right pupunta na tayo sa fourth Pero 2012, lumalabas na yung Data Privacy Cybercrime Prevention Act. So you might ask, okay, um, and then lately there's the Balik Scientist Act. No? This is, um, when I did my research, this is the first law mentioning AI. Um, encouraging lang Balik Sci uh, the Balik Scientist Program to, to prioritize AI um, in, in bringing scientists back. And then this is another law, no? anti osa exisaem this is the law prohibiting um, online sexual abuse and exploitation of children and child abuse or exploitation materials. So dito po, first time na mention yung salitang deepfake. Okay? So using deepfake to create child pornography is prohibited. And again, no, as you would notice, nasa tail end na siya. Nag, nag springboard na yung AI technologies way, way before. And yet we're just catching up. And then we have other um, laws, the Digital Workforce Competitiveness Act, um, 2022, not 2022, including summer youth camp, and um, promote a second congressional commission in education. And currently, we have three bills pending in the lower house on artificial intelligence by uh, Congressman Robert East Barbers, dalawa, ah, and uh, sorry, dalawa by attorney uh, by Keith Micah, attorney Mike Tan. So. So you know we've talked about um property as a means as property uh, sorry we've talked about technology as a means to uh, as property as a means to facilitate good and harm but if we think about it there is much much more to talk about no we have to talk about artificial intelligence as in relation to labor no under the labor code bo, um sabi don, uh, employee employers could um there is an authorized cost to terminate employees. One of the causes would be the installation of labor-saving devices. We know how much more efficient AI could do uh, work, diba? So, <clears throat> ano niyo, the state now should should be able to balance. Um, ano ba, do we encourage more automation and risk people losing more jobs? Or do we now prohibit AI para lang makatrabaho yung mga tao. So, these are things that need to be weighed, no? And then there's, of course, we know about, uh, you know, the Big Brother. Lately, there's that issue on the national, uh, sorry, the um, NCAP or the no-contact apprehension policy. So, basically, those are cameras watching the streets, no? So, that's Big Brother for you. State surveillance versus via big data. And then mentioned na already data privacy issues and data sets. And <clears throat> very um very fresh, no Lalana with the advent of Chat GPT. Now AI can create works, can create artwork. So mid-journey, we have that. Um, we also have AI that could invent now. So our laws, recall, no, our intellectual property code was enacted in 1998. So wala pang concepto ng generative AI yung batas nun. So how do we now make our laws 
in um catch up to the times and then let's say for self driving cars so sino may liability um the law that the law that um governs no yung mga liability and torts na yan, no? damages would be the civil code and nandun yung and yung in law school we study transportation law and a portion of that is found in the civil code which was in the 1950s tapos ang konsepto doon no um ang ang liable would be either the owner or the driver or now what if you have self driving cars who's na, sino na yung mananagot diba and then there are deep fakes and um environmental costs of artificial intelligence we cannot ha- we cannot talk about ai without talking about the mining industry about the miners no who extract the the minerals from the soil we cannot talk about um as as professor tihaki mentioned kanina we're we're said we're we're doing the labeling no we're doing um free labor for for the big companies so ai we should bring down ai from from the clouds basically into something that we can all relate about no um the environment you know lupa tao issues because at the end of the day ai is just some it's just a tool no it's just a tool that we could um that could either make us or break us so yeah with that thank you um passing you over back to uh, dr igot thanks angelo um i think we'll have more time to talk about Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is how the law interprets liability if it's an algorithm no, that does it. In a way, do you assign blame to the author of the algorithm? Something like that, no? maybe. But uh, I'll give the floor first to Jelaine. Uh, and then when we come back to you, that's, I think, a very important point that people have to be aware of. You know, How do you blame an algorithm for, for damages? No? Okay, I'm turning over to Jelaine um, to talk about Uh, generally risk management and governance of these uh, AI systems with particular focus on how would you advise clients, maybe in the private sector, how to go about it, uh, Jelaine? All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kiko. I'm um, just checking if you can hear me well. Yep. Very clear. All right. So, uh, well, first of all, um, uh, very, you know, um, rich discussion about artificial intelligence, but I want to focus really more on my insight on, you know, from practical point of view, really, right? So more for business owners, more for clients, right? Because at the end of the day, the questions to the CEO, and I was asked the same question in a similar summit uh, just a few months ago, is AI really an opportunity and a threat, right? That was even, you know, with um, President, President CEO of Union Bank, and there were discussion in that panel, panel that, Because I was saying that, you know, generally, I think, you know, wearing a consultant ha- hat, AI is definitely an opportunity, but there are a lot of, you know, risks and threats um, ar- arising from it as well. So um, now going back to your question, uh, Doc Kiko, about risk management. Um, so I think we've stressed enough, you know, in the previous panelists in terms of what are the risks that we're trying to address, right? The biases, the concerns on reliability, right? Data integrity also becomes uh, a big issue. Um, and I believe it's not really like uh, there's no one perfect fit solution at the moment. I feel that we're still in that perfect storm, you know, when it comes to AI, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how do we do this and what are some of the controls we need to put in place, right? So I I'm not gonna tell everyone do this and do that, right? Because we're still in that perfect storm which is good because any new technology blockchain ai and all we are part of you know we enter that kind of phase and then later on that storm will be converted more into uh practical frameworks right that could work so what i can advise uh what and i do normally advise our clients is that uh, at the end of the day it really starts with you know the AI framework, right? And and it's good. I do know AAP has been has been working about has been working on on the very important projects on AI standards and which we are actually actively participating, which is something that is quite important. Um, what we also need to consider before I go into risk management, you know, the confusions with CEOs nowadays and executives, they're getting mixed signals, right? So we're we're saying AI is an opportunity. There's so much. you know, that you can do there and it's going to disrupt your business. 
And then recent survey that we conducted, 85% of the executives globally, uh, this is 2023, agrees that there's so much opportunity in AI. And here we are discussing, you know, risks, right, on an AI. And then, you know, we're talking about biases. We're talking about deliberate errors encoded into the, you know, models, right, uh, that will uh, essentially affect the reliability, right? So they're getting mixed signals and they, they, they clearly don't know whether are they doing the right thing, right? Should they go into AI? And I think one way to um, address that kind of concern is establish that risk management process. And in my personal view, we're not even reinventing something from scratch. At the end of the day, AI is AI. When you talk about biases, when you talk about security, when you talk about privacy, you also have the same issue, whether it's AI, whether it's you know, different technology, blockchain, IoT, right? All, all of these things have security and privacy issues, right? And have other issues as well. So I feel we go back to the fundamentals of risk management. You know, one thing to look at because we don't have the time. I mean, if you let me talk, I, we're going to spend the whole day, you know, discussing a few things. But I think you just focus on the three lines, you know, um, you know, in every organization, first line is really more of, okay, what is management doing when it comes to AI? So they need to be able to, implement you know ai framework that needs to be followed by the whole organization this is how we plan to do it to address you know to be able to meet responsible ai right you talk about fairness reliability data integrity security so all within that framework of responsible ai the second line is your risk management and uh 66 percent of the survey we can look i'm going to share the thought leadership if that is an interest to everyone in the call but in the in the in the session 66% say they don't have an effective AI risk management function. And if organizations nowadays stick to their, you know, current risk management, then, then that's really where the problem is. But it's also a chicken and egg situation because what we've been observing is that for some of these organizations, as much as they want to establish risk management, they lack skills, right? They lack the necessary people and capable people to be able to address that. And the third line is audit. Audit still becomes part of it, right? So there's someone independent within the organization that can essentially check, right? Um, and I'm not talking about traditional audit on a cycle. We should look at, you know, uh, detection tools, right? Rapid detection tools on AI. And that's why I was also having discussion in similar, you know, this um, event and forum talking about AI and new tech. I was telling them, you, you know, we need to transform. This compliance as part of the third line needs to be more automated, needs to be rapid and agile, and should be able to detect and give, you know, um, insights right away to senior management. So I wanted to just wrap it around there. Should you have more, you know, uh, questions than this, I'd be happy to discuss it during the 15-minute session or maybe a separate session. You know, but uh, I hope that answers and give you uh, answers your question, Dr. Kiko, and gives an insight to our audience today. Thanks, Jelaine. Actually, it's good you brought up the three lines of defense because it's something that can be very clearly explained to CEOs. My, my comment exactly. there, co yeah, coming from a, a risk uh, experience myself, I noticed everyone seems to default to the audit mentality. Like everyone wants a checklist, everyone wants some form of structure. And everyone wants to blame someone. <laughs> That's very audit. Uh, I think the second line is under, in a way, underrepresented because in risk yes. management, it's not just about checklists. You have to anticipate risks that are yes. imaginary. And they set the and standards. They set the standards, right? Yes. Exactly. Right. So I think capability in that second line for AI, I'm right, right now I'm at a loss how to build it. Maybe in, if we do a second round and we get back to you, you can give some thoughts on that. Because I feel that that's, that's the glue that makes this the work. The cost, right? Exactly. Yeah, so if we, for me, if I we have to rely on audit to save the day, tapos na yung laban. No? Yeah, which should not be the case, you know, from a three-line, you know, design point of view, yeah. right? So so it has to be equally, you know, um, uh, capable, right? To be able to perform their role on AI. Okay. Um, we'll, I'll throw the floor back to, no, no, throw the floor, I'll throw the mic back to Leanne. Uh, we had some trouble with your slides earlier. Hopefully my screen will share better. Let me know. So I think you were talking about this, uh, horizon of risks. Uh, you want to pick it up here, Leanne, and, uh, discuss this. 
Yeah, so it's good that we ended on a discussion on risk management, right? And that's it. First of all, we have to identify what risks are we going to prioritize. And before we go to the prioritization, we have to know first what really are the pool of risks. Um, next slide, please. So I, as I was emphasizing a while ago, it is a horizon of risks across intelligent systems. And it is... Um, across systems. So for learning from the developments at the global level, so I, um, I previously featured um, selected developments uh, since 2020 on how other countries are doing it, whether that is from a research perspective, a government perspective, a civil society perspective, and so on and so forth. Now, we want to emphasize that um, actually, the, the photo uh, on the lower left pane, is that correct? Yeah, is actually uh, an article released uh, just a while ago uh, in The Verge. And again, picking up on what Angelo uh, has mentioned a while ago. Um, there is a human behind the development of AI systems. So we also have to consider there are human issues. In fact, when there's this... Um, term always thrown such as um, AI will bring new form of jobs, true, but at the moment it is also producing very demeaning jobs. And if you want uh, more detail on that, just search AI annotators and, and that's a different kind of worms. So there. And so how do we go about this, right? So now looking at the diagram now, um, I, I want to give um, perspective. What is the green uh, box on the background and the red um, box on the uh, upper right is? So the green one is talking about AI ethics and policy. This is the concern of the AI ethics and policy. And then on the red box is the concern of AI safety and alignment. So those are our risks. Now, um, on to the next slide, please. So there you go. AI capability and harms. It is cross-cutting because AI is a general purpose technology with high risk and high reward. And so what is the unnecessary challenge today, right? I was talking about there are legitimate risks and there's an upcoming dangers, but it's actually an unnecessary worry. So there, you have your doomsday sentiments, and then you also have your factionalist um, AI immediate harms block. Don't bother, that is not a problem at all. You should not be talking to AI safety and alignment people. We cannot remove in the equation the risk on AI as a global risk and an existential risk. But there's also the danger that if we focus on that too much, then there's your factionalist AI alignment researcher, you know, that says the AI ethicists and uh, policy people do not see the bigger problem and that alignment should only be the focus. It's like saying, you don't consider the climate crisis when you want a disaster risk management program on earthquake. And then you are also um, tossing coin if you need to provide first aid and medical services. So you see, this is not linear at all. On to next, please. And so here we are now which is also part of the um, added danger in this whole AI development and regulation uh, landscape. You have some regulators or people who are the popular figures in the regulation and governance saying that we should amend the law and mitigate terminator AI when they know nothing about AI. And then you also have your antisocial techno solutionists who would say, we should go out in the public, tweak classifiers in the system, prompt chat GPT for solutions, and just declare that AI is an existential risk. Like it's, it's detrimental to public health 
and public crisis management. That's why um, the general public is induced in anxiety and fear right now. Hence, um, the majority of um, new the tones of the news in mainstream uh, topic uh, uh, news on AI, right? So, and, and, and the problem with that is it goes without saying that when you approach it that way, it's like declaring, um, it's like saying uh, rape is a woman existential, uh, is, rape is a woman risk to a seven-year-old kid. The seven-year-old is not prepared for even what are the notions of sex, sexuality, and then there's rape, right? So imagine the fear that, that will go. And, and that is detrimental to the policymaking process or just even a proper conversation among different stakeholders across fields coming to a comprehensive take on how to develop and regulate AI. And so now uh, on to the next, please. Um, what is uh, what is our approach in the ambit and the ambit Philippines is our public call, and in our public call, next please. Um, you can um, scan this QR code, and we propose thirteen provisions there on where the Philippines can start. Now, onto the question of should we have a law? Yes, and in fact, it should be immediate because. Your experts on AI, or let's say your, your probable experts on AI governance, who should be talking in that field should have a platform, a fund, and um, a consolidation process. Now, that is difficult when you do not have um, a mandate for that. And when we are talking about accountability and liability that will be derived from risk management, well, accountability and liability usually stem from hard law, if it is a mandate. Because um, everyone will just do their own if there's no a hard law in place in the first place. So. What, what, where are we going with here now? In, in the petition, the first two requests actually is um, the public consult consultation of the national AI strategy. So the experts and the stakeholders um, put themselves forward. And then the second is the establish of the advisory committee on these topics even there is no um, official uh, document for the national AI strategy yet. And so I believe that um, this panel and the member, the panelists present today is a good start. Now the question now is how can we move it from here uh, into action because our, our neighbors in Southeast Asia, our neighbor countries in Southeast Asia already started in 2020 or even before that. And so I would like to give back uh, the floor to Doc. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lian. And uh, for the ones listening on Facebook, I also shared the link of the petition that Lian mentioned. Please feel free to check it out and see if you, you agree with it. Uh, I want to go turn the floor back to uh, Professor Ben. You know, we've had a lot of uh, inputs from all the speakers. Maybe you can react or opine on some of the points you heard and uh, try to add your bit. We were talking about harms earlier. Yeah, Doc, uh, my pleasure. Uh, this is a very rich discussion, so I think it helps to classify what we're talking about because AI is a very broad field, as we all know, no? extends back to you know uh, vision, uh, deep learning, etc. I think the the biggest concern now is large language models because they mimic human speech and therefore they can be very convincing. So I, I like the way attorney Angela brought in the legal perspective because the constitution is also very clear that our overriding vision is a rising standard of living and quality of life for all. Everything else is supposed to be instrumental to that goal. 
So for example, if we will massively allow AI deployment, but it will make our people more jobless and miserable, I don't think that's what the constitution envisioned. Uh, with due respect, of course, to encouraging scientists to innovate. Uh, there are many examples of innovations algorithmic innovations that the government stopped. For example, you will remember during the global financial crisis, the central bank took a hard line on preventing advanced financial derivatives to enter our marketplace. When all other Western economies were playing with derivatives, we were not. So we were not as affected by the global financial crisis because we did not play with these sophisticated financial tools. The same can happen with AI if we just think that any innovation is helpful for people. This is not the case. Innovations have to be certified as aligned and safe. Aligned means they must be aligned with human values, which is to improve quality of life, and they must be safe, meaning they must be certified as not being harmful. So there are two things that, need, that we need to look at. So the ideas that we present in this panel can really be important inputs to those who have to make decisions, whether it's on the risk management side of companies, then boards should ask those who propose AI, is what you're proposing aligned? Is it in service of positive human values? And then is it certified safe? So that if we are brought to litigation, we can say that we check for the safety and we know that it's reasonably safe. In the case of the Uber car that killed this uh, Arizona lady, the, the human companion was charged because apparently the, the blame went to the human companion because she did not intervene when the car ran down a woman walking with a bike. Obviously, the, the, the car was not trained to recognize that the human walking with the bike is a human. That's why my suggestion to all of these autonomous driving companies is they should train all of their autonomous cars in the Philippines. It will recognize every human that violates every rule, right? But to me, I think the executives who allowed the deployment of so-called autonomous cars also have accountability. But it will take years, you know, because of expensive litigation and expensive lawyers arguing this before any executive is held into account. And that is for sure. But in the meantime, people will be run down by autonomous cars. So the point we're saying is why not just take every effort to make sure that AI is checked for alignment and safety? Because these are core ethical values anyway if they are not sure but for example in the old days we, we were saying well you can generate ai as long as you don't put it in the internet they broke the first rule i think you're on mute prof ben oh was i on mute the whole time uh, no prof? just just the last just the last one I see, so I didn't do anything, so it could be the AI intervening. Anyway, uh, what I was saying is that if you have a gain-of-function lab in China, and then suddenly you connected that to the public, you could have a major global epidemic. I'm saying that's a hypothetical case. This is the case here. AI that was not yet certified as aligned and safe were released. So that means we need to be very careful how this is used, because we know the risk that it can uh, bring to the public. How to approach it, I think Peter, Angelo, Lian, uh, and our risk management expert, they all have these very nuanced approaches that I think we can combine for a very balanced approach to this, but always bearing in mind that our goal is quality of life for our people and not to be the playground of expensive toys produced by trillion-valued corporations in the West. That's not, that's not the role of the Philippines in the global market. We have more than 100 million people we need to uplift. And that, for me, is the goal. Let's use AI for that. Back to you, Doc. Thanks, Prof. Ben. Before Prof. Peter, Leanne, you wanted to interject. Yeah, um, just a context to what Professor Ben is saying and connect this to the expertise of Jello as well, because I have the global perspective, right? Um, in fact, the uh, one of the factors um, affecting the conditions, I mean, the decisions on in terms of uh, liability and accountability on autonomous vehicles is also where, in, in what country we are talking about. And, and this was um, um, a very interesting talk uh, in a um, program under MIT. And the manufacturers of cars in, from the US and from Europe was there. And the perspective given was in the US, even AI is not yet in the equation. 
the accountability and the liability is in, on the people. So to the owner of the car. Meanwhile, in Europe, the, the context is the accountability is on the manufacturer of the car. So there. And so it becomes a point of contention when uh, there is a, um, um, a case for um, autonomous, there was an autonomous vehicle case in China with a US manufactured car and they don't know how the accountability and liability process would go for that. So yeah, um, back to Doc. Thanks, Clian. Um, Prof. Peter, you want to pick it up here? Um, you were talking earlier about governance challenges, and I think that's a good segue after this issue on accountability and liability. But uh, hearing my colleagues uh, talk about uh, AI, uh, I think there is uh, already consensus uh, or near consensus the approach should be uh, risk-based uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, the challenges. But uh, I think uh, we, have, we have serious limitations in that area as well because um, uh, the assumption that we know the risk uh, is is just not uh, is just unfounded. There is uh, known unknown. There is also unknown unknown. Uh, you've seen how uh, large, large language models have uh, have seen uh, double exponentials. For instance, uh, you teach them in English, and then later on you discover that all along they had capability to uh, you know uh, you know understand uh, or or uh, say things in in uh, in uh, Sanskrit. So uh, truly uh, unprecedented and could be urgent. So if you look now at the traditional formulation of this would be harm times probability, but we, we know for a fact that the, the harm may not, the, 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 the range of harms uh, are not even uh, really, con uh, are not even uh, 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 considered risk, are uh, considered well. So that risk might not be limited to, to just uh, harms on the um, on the alignment problem, uh, we have to note that um, uh, this is a, a a an ongoing concern because um, there is no guarantee that uh, the machine will not override the original goal set by humans. So and that's that's as is again uh, going to be an uncharted uh, category and then the unknown unknown side. So um, back to the to the governments, there is there is. Uh, there are there are all sorts of probability going on. Uh, the probabilities may not even be normally distributed, uh, but but we have to approach this really more on 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 local. Uh, even as we think of of uh, of, of global uh, global uh, actions, uh, as they say, the environmentalists would say, uh, think uh, I mean uh, think globally, act locally, because uh, many of the forces are really beyond us. There is geopolitics uh, going on. Uh, the 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 digital order. Is pretty much shaped by the by the by the uh, world economic and uh, security orders. So we have to to navigate this while at the same time, of course, uh, um, privileging the interests of our of our people, as uh, Prof Ben would uh, constantly remind us. Thank you. Thanks, Prof Peter. Before Angelo, uh, Ben, you wanted to interject. I see your hand. Uh, yes, uh, quickly. Uh, because I appreciated the way uh, Peter outlined key uh, items for us to consider. On the risks, precisely, on, on Peter's point, in management, we have a basic principle. Do not do something you do not understand. So when a company deploys a product and it doesn't understand what it is doing, that is the height of irresponsibility. Because all the major technological advances that we all depend on now, from cars to airlines to electricity, there were huge conventions that were held so that rules on stoplights, on uh, voltage uh, levels in our wall outlets at home, these were all regulated so that people would be safe. So that's very important what Peter is saying. If the risks are unknown, the rule is restraint, prudence. On the matter of goals, yes, uh, LLMs, especially deep learning models, are known to develop sub-goals which uh, have unpredictable effects. But there are also designs that are being proposed, like uh, Russell Stewart, a well-known AI guru, has already proposed a design for human-compatible AI. He's, he shared this work nearly 10 years ago. But since deep learning models are so impressive, the, the human-compatible designs are not being given a chance. Right? It's like you're driving F1 uh, cars in, in Philippine roads because they're impressive and fast. But they're not attuned to realities. They, they can run down people. right? So we need to advocate that better designs that do not run away 
are given more attention by companies. They're not as sexy, but they're actually safer. And of course, global politics, again, uh, Peter is on point. APEC in particular, we need to have a bigger voice in this conversation because Europe and North America are dominating the discussion. The, the, the American companies are the ones investing billions in this technology, whereas the data are scraped from a lot of us Asians. So we should have a voice on the policy uh, area. So I think APEC in particular is a good platform for us and hopefully maybe in the next IAAP sessions, we can have an APEC level discussion to address uh, the concern of uh, politics, geopolitics that Peter has cited. Back to you, Doc. Thanks, Prof. Ben. Um, for Angelo, uh, if you don't mind, I'll read a question on the Q&A box. By the way, to everyone in the live uh, Zoom, you feel free to address your questions to the panelists in the Q&A box. They're busy answering it while we're having a discussion. So this is from Ken from the SEC. Uh, given the risks associated with the new innovations of AI, uh, it is best for the IPO uh, intellectual property office to cover this risk area upon issuance of patents as long as there's no current group supervising AI. I don't know, Angelo, do you want to react to this? In, in a way, it's a good segue to intellectual property law, uh, law no, which is, uh, I would say, a blind spot for the mainstream right now. Yeah, right. Thank you for the question, Ken. Thanks for raising that talk. Um, and so far as I, I used to work in the intellectual property office, so uh, I, I do know this space also. And so far as they're concerned, they're just checking whether or not the technology is new, um, whether or not it's inventive or not, uh, whether or not it's inventive and whether or not it can be applied in, in the industry. Um, there's that there's that also that portion, no? Na patents which are contrary to public order and morality cannot be patented. So inventions that are contrary to public order and morality. But if you think about it, AI is not inherently immoral, right? Or contrary to public morality. So, um, and in fact, no, if you have, let's say, a, a very bad use of AI, hindi man naman siya ilalagay dun sa patent application mo and risk your, your patent to be rejected, right? So your application to be rejected. So um, insofar as they're concerned, they will they could patent technologies, no? Um, now, whether or not you use it for good or bad is a different matter altogether, and which should be in line with your ethics and with other laws. For example, um, there's that mention on deep fake law, kanina, di ba? Um, anti um, sexual abuse exploitation materials, children. So, if you think about it, if you use deep fake, deep fakes inherently are not immoral, right? But if you think of, uh, if you use it for something that's nefarious, then that's where the issue comes in. So kaya anadun yung um there's that law prohibiting the specific use of deep fakes. So um yes, yeah, sir, sir Peter, would you add something? Uh, yeah, uh we also have to step back and entertain the possibility that the entire um uh, patent regime is uh, is broken. Uh I, I will have we're going to have a, a whole new discussion about that in a, in a separate occasion because of uh um the, the tragedy of the anti communities at play. Yes, uh, artists and uh, content creators have to be rewarded, but patent is just one possibility. There's all sorts of reward systems that enable us to innovate quickly, fast. I mean, quickly and substantially enough, uh, even as you you consider uh, alternatives to uh, to the uh, IP loss we have at the, at the moment. This is something that is a relic. Uh, maybe in separate discussions, we'll have uh, a, a more fun time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Prof. Ben, you wanted to add something as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, Peter made a good point about looking at the bigger systems also. Uh, uh, but going back, I, I think the key is to make sure that the goal for the use of AI is clear, that we hold people accountable for whether the systems they are, because we use morality a lot, and uh, it is mentioned in the Constitution. But what is moral for us, right? That's, that's the discussion we're having. Is it moral to be fake? I don't think so. I, I've always uh, told, even those billboards, you know, where you have... Uh, an actor claiming that because he eats so much tuna, his abs improves. That's fake. And I've told my friends in the corporate sector that please don't do that. That's, you bring this honor to the business enterprise because you're misleading people. Now we have more businesses at least saying uh, with, uh, with a good diet or they should say with 1,000 reps of uh, right? sit-ups, right? 
but at least they're now more conscious that you cannot mislead people. It's immoral. But of course, the standards of people have become very low. We just take it for granted that, oh, sure, they're a business, so they will pull your leg. Of course not. Some businesses don't pull your leg. And we should draw a line somewhere. And if we cannot draw the line with humans, that's no wonder we're being so loose with AI. But really, that is causing a moral crisis everywhere when nobody is expected to be truthful anymore. Because you can get away with saying, oh, I was just, you know, the technical term is I was just bullshitting. I didn't mean harm. But for me, in certain contexts, to be bullshitting is harmful because you're misleading people. And I think that is a fundamental ethical concern. No? Yeah, I have something to say about that as well. From personal experience, there's a training provider that used my face to sell their training course. And I think people know who they are. And 10,000 people bought it. And not because they thought anything of that training provider, but they trusted me. So I think there's, yeah, there, there's, there's really a responsibility, even before you even talk about legalities on what is ethical business behavior? Obviously, in their case, it's probably a legal issue already, you know, but yeah, I echo that. Um, I want to give the floor to Jelaine. Uh, obviously, you've had time to observe and hear all of the points uh, from, a, I guess, you're, you're playing the practical archetype. Now, how, how would you approach all of these discussions from a practical perspective? Wow. Um, yeah, that's a um, very tough question, no? Doc, Doc Kiko. No? So I think, you know, if I look at it, you know, from my client's point of view, right, at the end of the day, as I said, 85% of the global survey we conducted, you know, on AI says that they, they know that they have to be in the AI, you know, they need to be able to leverage AI one way or another, right? So everyone understands the value of AI. Um, but what what we need to do is we need to make sure that, you know, we can enable all practices, you know, the public, the private, to ensure that we can um, put the right safeguards and, and measures, right? In, in this in, in the use of AI. Is it going to be like a perfect journey? None of these new technology you know has undergone like a perfect journey wherein standards are set even before it happens, right? So normally um, standards are built, regulations are released, you know, as we discover new things about the technology. And I feel that's what's happening in AI. Um, I think what the businesses nowadays would need to have is they need to be able to um, leverage whether or at least have a criteria to determine whatever they're doing now makes sense and whatever they're doing now is the right thing to do, right? So I think the immediate thing that we need to work on is how to be able to release those standards and guidelines for businesses because it's also not net not going to be more of like a perfect standard or idea. As I mentioned, it's a discovery. We're in that perfect storm, right? So, and and that's why I'm a 150% supporter of what AAP is doing already, you know, with different parties in terms of coming up, basing it with the ISO AI standards and try to localize it as well for us here in the Philippines because, um. You know, these CEOs, presidents, and executives, even our government, I, I should say, because I've been, you know, dealing with several, you know, um, characters and personalities now with our government, they're sharp and and they're smart. They know that um, there are certain considerations, you no, know, in that they have to put in place when you know, when you, when adopting on this technology. But at the end of the day, they look for consultants like us. Or, or because they need guidance, right? They need to know, okay, how do I check? How, how do I assess that we're doing the right thing, right? So I think um, with the expertise here in the call, I'm just amazed to be part of these panelists with, uh, with our Prof. Ben and everyone. So I think this is the right group, you know, to essentially help in making sure we construct those standards because once it's there, I can assure you, right, the maturity that we're trying to say here or the expectations that we're trying to say here, it's going to be implemented faster because there's something that we have set as a standard, you know, nationwide, that that's what you should follow, you know, when applying and adopting AI. 
I'm not sure if it makes sense. I'm trying to paint it more of a broad level because I don't want to go into like, like the technicalities of it. But I think that's really where we should go as a state or as a stage. Uh, not yet the whole journey, but I think we can start from there. Yeah, my immediate reaction there is we we shouldn't just think of the stick. There's also the carrot approach. And right now, there are no carrots. <laughs> it's all potential sticks. <laughs> exactly. No? So again, um, exactly. we're we're pressed for time. Thanks, Jelaine. I'll use that as your uh, kind of closing uh, round. No, I'll let Leanne react immediately because she she was asking to react. And then Leanne, give your closing, and then we'll go in reverse order and ask everyone to close. So Leanne, for yeah. Um. So while the consensus is the risks based approach, we I I just also want to um, remind uh, us, you know, the the. Uh, people here in this panel and to our audience as well, that it's not the only approach available now. There's also the rights-based approach. So, uh, and there's, you also have your values or priorities-based approach. So what are the case examples for, what are the examples for those would be, um, for instance, there is a segment in the Council of Europe on AI Treaty to consider a fundamental rights um, impact assessment as a requirement uh, for, for audit and risks management. And then on the other hand, a, a very good example for the priorities-based approach is your Caribbean AI roadmap. So, uh, and, and that's Caribbean. So you see it's, it's almost the equivalent of what could be an Asia Pacific, right? But the countries under the Caribbean region um, one of the one of their wins in their roadmap is that they chose uh, ecosystem flourishing and environmental protection as a priority in their AI roadmap because their region is, is situated in um, uh, environment in a vulnerable environmental context. So there is that. And um, on my concluding part, um, as as I've have mentioned before, uh, the uh, panelists uh, in, in this segment of the summit are good starting points. What we need is action, and by action is timeline and direction. We don't actually, we don't know yet how, like um, um, how Jeline mentioned it a while ago, it's not the whole staircase. We just need to know what we have to do from 2023 to 2025 at the very least and um, come together in a direction that will uh, both innovate and then at the same time put human dignity at the forefront of AI development. So yeah, um, to the other panelists. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Angelo, over to you for closing. Thanks, Doc. Um, so there's much work to be done. Yesterday, uh, we've been saying over and over, education needs to be done. Um, for me, um, there's much work to be done needed to educate the policymakers, because as as I've outlined in um in my quick presentation earlier, the laws that we have are just prohibitive. Don't use AI for this. Don't use AI for that. But if you're if all of the laws you have are uh, already you're boxing AI, no. Um, maganda yun na mention kanina na we should create instead a framework that would allow research to flourish instead no create pathways o dito lang kayo mag dito lang kayo mag uh, mag research because dito green light to um beyond that medyo hazy try not to go beyond that um so um there was also mention I, I was there was, there was also mentioned yesterday um you know that the technical people should also be represented in policy um for me though the policy people should also know the technical portions Kasi madaling, uh, I'm, I'm doing lectures to lawyers and a lot of them would say they're technophobes. So they would not touch AI or or talk about it no, um, in a very deep manner. So so without that um that deeper understanding of what AI really is, which is just a tool, no? And when I ask lawyers, sometimes I ask, oh, what is AI? Sabi nila equals chat GPT. Sabi ko, no, that it's much more than that, no? Um, 
So there's a lot of work to be done. Kami sa UP Law Center, we're, 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 we're doing that work. We're educating lawyers, policymakers. And um, we'd like to be in more discussions with the industry also. Kasi, um, you know, with, with a multidisciplinary approach, we learn from each other. We You, you get naman into the hands, headset of the law. Kasi sometimes, no, when I was taking my master's, um, minsan tinatanong ko, teka, legal ba itong ginagawa ko? Kunwari, web scraping. Madaling mag-web scrape ng data. Tapos, napapisip ako, legal ba to? So, my colleagues, my, my classmates who are not lawyers, probably they're not asking that. But ako, malidisbar ba ako pag ginawa ko to? <laughs> so, um, we, we also need no, that technical people should also um, try to speak the language of, of lawyers para hindi, para mawala agad yung mag-break down yung barriers of communication. So, here's that. Um, open communication for everyone. Thank you for the um, opportunity. Thanks, Attorney Angelo. Uh, Professor Peter, your closing thoughts? Just uh, quickly uh, to note that uh, th there is a tendency in some sectors to homogenize the conception of AI. AI is very diverse. Full disclosure, I'm very much immersed in the production of synthetic media. Uh, you know, some some uh, some friends, uh, we, we do this. Uh, but um, instead of uh, uh, rushing to consider um, uh, whole, uh, top, top down uh, uh, regulation, we should consider uh, reviewing the, the existing ones and see if they can be updated uh, to accommodate uh, the diverse AI practices and also uh, put in the safeguards that are due uh, to, to the, the diverse practices of, of AI in a way. Thank you. Thanks. Over to Prof. Ben. Last word. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for such a generative discussion. So I think so much insight has been generated. So I always like to summarize by saying we are building a nation. Uh, when I was born, we were the biggest economy in ASEAN, and then we were overtaken by our neighbors one by one, and in 2020, even Vietnam has a bigger economy than us. So we have much work to do, and essentially it is about helping our people to be the best versions of themselves so that they can be productive, socially connected to their families, to their communities, and we need the best tools to achieve this. But the tool must be safe and it must help us in positive ways. Uh, I'm a little bit cautious about the use of the term tool because for me, a tool has been certified for a purpose and it is safe. When I use a screwdriver, I know that I can exert force on it and it will not break and poke me in the eye, right? That's a tool. For me, AI in many forms now, I would call them toys. They're not yet tools because they, have, they are not yet certified to be fit for purpose. They have not yet been engineered to achieve a specific goal that is aligned with human values in a risk-free environment and that elevates, to use Leon's phrase, human dignity. I think we will get to the tool part of AI once the standards have been rolled out and people have been educated to handle this thing very carefully in the same way that governments have done with uh, nuclear power, with uh, genomics, with, uh, with everything else, with uh, viruses, etc. So once we achieve that, and I think if this panel can continue growing the discussion, then we may have good AI tools, but we need to be very vigilant because the global environment for corporate competition is really what drives this process now. And we know that global capitalism is a very powerful force, but humans have to engage these systems. We are part of it. And I think in the end, we can prevail and still build a better Philippines. Thank you, Doc. Thanks, Prof. Ben, and I think that there's no better way to end our panel. So first, I want to thank again our panelists, uh, Professors uh, Ben Tihanki, Professor Peter C., uh, Attorney Angelo Santiago, Mr. Jelaine Manrique, and of course, Ms. Lian Shua, for it's still just scratching the surface, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think we're have this is a this is this this panel, if I compare it to one year ago totally different dimension and yeah looking forward to future panels to come um, before we all go away i think we need to do the customary photo op uh, with everyone and uh, after that i'll turn it over to uh, michelle no? so are we going to take the photo now yeah actually just i uh, wanted to give uh, a small token of our appreciation to our panelists um 
old style, you know, something that maybe hopefully AI cannot do yet, which is journaling our thoughts, imagining, feeling, writing down our emotions. Um, so you'll get this as soon as uh, we have these delivered to your address, of course. Uh, but uh, maybe for the photo, we can make this part of our collage um, with the panel, if that's okay. Yes, sure. Um, I'll include that na lang. I'll just adjust the size from my end. And all right, I think um, all I need are your smiles. <laughs> so, okay, taking the photo. Um, Miss Michelle, I'd love for you to also have your camera open for this, <laughs> for this photo. Ayan, okay. Taking the photo in three, two, one, smile. All right, one more for safety. Three, two, one, smile. All right. For safety, that's great. Okay, yeah, for AI safety. Thank you very much.